27. Matthew chapter 27. We are again dealing with the seven sayings from Calvary series. This is the fourth message. And it's in Matthew 27. We're going to be looking at the words of abandonment. Words of abandonment. And uh, in verse 46, it says, About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The first message that we dealt with four weeks ago was on the words of affection. Forgive, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then we dealt with words of acceptance. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Then last week, words of attachment. Behold thy mother and behold thy son. Today we're going to be dealing with the words of abandonment. The first message we saw the plea of Jesus. The next one the pardon. Then we've seen the provisions. Today we're going to see the passion. We're going to see the Lord suffering. There's something different when Jesus speaks this time. The time that Jesus speaks, the fourth time on the cross, is unlike any other time that He said anything ever in His ministry. Then we'll see next week, I thirst the pain in the week after. Into thy hands I commend my spirit, the pronouncement. And then finally, the power of God to be revealed when he says, it is finished. But I want you to look with me again here in Matthew. I want to read some, a little bit more than usual to you this morning. But I want to give you something to, uh, I want to make sure you understand what's going on here in this passage. Look at verse 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his hand. And they bowed the knee to him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him. And they took a reed and smote him on the head. And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put on his raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon, by, the, by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar, vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head an accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by, reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocked him with, scribes and, with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be king of the if he be king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. Now, from the sixth hour. Pay attention here. Now from the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Darkness came into this world. And about the ninth hour, three hours after hanging in the darkness, Jesus cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the fourth 
time that Jesus spoke. Here in Matthew, I wanted you to notice what was going on. For when Jesus speaks this time, it's unlike any other time that He ever spoke. Jesus is the same one who stepped out on a boat in the middle of a storm and spoke to the wind and the sea and they ceased and obeyed Him. He is the calmer of the storms. Jesus spoke and blind people's eyes were open. He spoke and deaf people could hear. He spoke and people could who were lame got up and walked. He spoke and those that could not speak were the dumb were able to speak. When He spoke, devils fled from people. When He spoke, the dead even rose from the dead. But now He speaks and it's unlike any other time that he has ever spoken. He speaks under the weight of the sin of the world. This prayer is not on the behalf of someone else. It is, but this prayer, he's asking a question. We, we see the seven sayings, and we've studied the seven sayings, and we've, we've heard about the seven sayings, but what, have you ever stopped and took a fresh look at what he was saying? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's a question. God... Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. Martin Luther, the reformer back from the 1600s, Martin Luther, not the commie fake that, that got a holiday. Martin Luther, sitting, meditated for hours that turned into days, fasting over that very verse. My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? They said when he arose, he exclaimed, God forsaking God, how can it be? But that's exactly what we're on. God had separated for a brief time. God cannot look upon sin. God is too holy. Hold your, hold your place here. Or let me read a verse to you. Here, let me read you something in Habakkuk. Chapter 1, verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Whereof lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously? He said, the Bible says that he could not look upon iniquity. Jesus was asking that question to the Father. Why hast thou forsaken me? But Jesus is deity. Jesus is all-knowing. Jesus knew the answer. Jesus knew that it was my sin and your sin that separated Him from the Father for that time. He understood that. He had prayed before He even went to the cross, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew He was dying for the sins of the world. He knew that God was going to let Him become sin for us who knew no sin, that, he might be made the, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He understood that. He asked that question so you would realize it. He asked that question so you would think, why did God turn the lights off? And forsake his only begotten son. Because he was paying for my sin. Because he was paying for your sin. Sin will not go unpunished. God is too holy, too pure for, to let that pass. So my sin had to be paid for. And Jesus was paying for it. Amen. On the cross of Calvary. And under the weight of that sin in that darkness... Alone, he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible clearly teaches that sin separates from God. In Isaiah 59, 2, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. 
Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden walked with God in the cool of the day. And as they walked with God in the cool of the day, they had fellowship. And day by day they had fellowship till one day sin entered in. And that fellowship was broken. That fellowship was never the same. God slayed an animal. He made a provision to where they could have some form of reconciliation, but they never were as close, never was recorded again that God walked with them in the cool of the day. Day by day, they enjoyed that fellowship, but sin had entered in. Sin had drove a wedge between man and his God. But God had made a temporary covering in the shedding of an innocent animal and putting its skins on them to cover their sins. It was but temporary. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and He made the permanent sacrifice. The eternal sacrifice according to Hebrews 7. Once and for all, Hebrews 9, and forever set down at the hand of the Father. He was the Lamb of God. The perfect sacrifice. His sacrifice ended all the animal sacrifices. You ever wonder why no one sacrifices animals anymore? You read the Old Testament, they're killing heifers and, I mean, lions, tigers, bears. It don't matter. If it moved, they killed it and put it on the altar. Amen. Just about it seemed like. But when Jesus died, the Lamb of God, there were no more. The veil in the temple was rent in twain, showing that God had accepted that sacrifice and had opened the door for fellowship once again. We have that fellowship today if we want it. Amen? But, but what I wanted to talk a little bit about was this fourth saying here. I want to give you three things, and I don't plan on being long. But look at verse 45, the end. It says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he says that after verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the all, excuse me, notice that, all the face of the land. I want to tell you why I'm bringing that out, because I want to show you something in a minute. First thing I want to look at is the darkness. It was over all the land. All the land. Is that not what it says? Some people say, well, all the land means all the land there at Jerusalem or all the land in Israel or all the land in the Middle East. Or is it all the land? The entire world. Let me give you something to think about. The Jewish day starts at 6 o'clock. And if it's about the sixth hour, that makes it noon day. It is high noon. And the ninth hour is three o'clock. So from noon our time to three o'clock, it was dark. You know what happens from noon to three around most places? That's when the sun's at its highest point in the sky. From noon to three is right in there when the sun's going to shine the brightest. From noon to three, the sun refused to shine. When the sun, God's creation, saw what man was doing to the Creator, it refused to give its light. So that a sinful, spectating crowd could be entertained, the lights went out. Just like darkness blanketed the land of Egypt, when the plagues came in, a darkness so dark that it could be felt, I believe it got dark. Now, the, that's a supernatural darkness. During that time, Jesus suffered the full weight of my sins. During that time, God poured out on Him the wrath. Jesus drank of the cup of that indignation. Jesus was dying for my sins and your sins alone in the dark. That darkness was supernatural. But I also want to deal with the skeptics. The skeptics try to say, and the scientists and the, and, and the, and the 
And those that don't believe in the atheists, they try to explain it away. They try to use science and reason and try to say that the Bible's not true or try to say this happened and that's what it was. It wasn't a miracle. It wasn't, it wasn't the sun refusing to shine. It wasn't God turning the light out. It was an eclipse. There was an eclipse that took place. But here, I'm going to show you how dumb and dangerous that is. An eclipse at the Passover when the moon is in a full moon, that's the phase that it's in during that time. There would be no eclipse. It would have been in the wrong location. But even if you study it and find out that it couldn't have happened at that time, think about this. An eclipse only lasts for minutes. We're talking three hours. An eclipse, when it goes through in the rotation of the earth and the movement of the sun and the moon and, uh, and the earth and everything working together, it's almost like a shadow just walks across the land. And you have to be in the path of that eclipse. And when it's eclipsed, it's total. It only lasts for a minute. And then it's moved. A few years back, there was one that one eclipse that went across America. The shadow went across America. Said it was supposed to be one of the greatest ones, and he was supposed to get dark. We did get a little bit dim. I mean, it was a little dusk. I mean, you could tell it was different. Some people actually traveled to go where it was so their kids could experience something happening, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's great. I applaud them for doing that. They got to see something. But they'll tell you it didn't last three hours. This said, and darkness was over all the land. It don't affect all the land either. It just, goes, shadow just goes across to certain areas. We experienced one here in America, but over there in the Middle East and China, they may not have seen any of it. This affected all the land. It was supernatural. Some say, well, there was a fog bank come in. High noon to three o'clock in the Middle East. That was pretty spectacular. Oh, it was a dust cloud that blew up and blew over. No, it was supernatural. Jesus died in the dark because it was spiritual too. That physical darkness was showing man where he stood spiritually. Jesus died physically in the dark to show where man were spiritually in the dark. Spiritually, man is groping for answers and can't find it. They're looking into science and they're looking into all these different areas trying to find answers they'll never find till they go to Calvary and see the Savior. Till they go to Calvary and hear what He had to say and how He took our place. Mankind spiritually stumbles in the dark, not knowing the love of God nor His will to save them. The light of the world hung in darkness for you and I. We've got to guard our hearts against that darkness because it's in us naturally. Seeing entered into the world and we have that old Adamic nature in us and we've got to guard ourselves that we don't get accustomed to it and used to it. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. That's why when you go to a bar, most of the time the lights are dim because you're not there for spiritual reasons. You come into church and the lights is on. You can see everything, but you go into a bar and it's real dim. And people like going getting in the corners and thinking that because it's dim and it's dark, people can't see their evil deeds. They love the darkness. When they're getting into mischief, sometimes they'll close the door and put the blinds down like God don't see. Oh, my. But anyway, think about this. Let me find a way to illustrate it. One time a preacher had taken a new church and he stood there after a week or so of surveying the city, the surroundings and everything where he was located and he was getting to know the new area where he was going to minister. He was standing one day in his office staring out the window, weeping, 
looking over a city that was filled with druggies and prostitution, where the news was always rapes and murder and thefts and carjackings and beat, people being beat up and all this horrible stuff. He stood there and he looked out his window at that inner city that he was to minister, weeping when a layman walked in and saw him and wanted to console him. He said, it'll be all right. You'll get used to it in a little while. And the preacher said, exactly. That's why I'm crying. Because we are in it and we get so used to it that it no longer bothers us that our families are lost. Our co-workers are lost. The evil that's around us don't bother us anymore. We're used to it. But Jesus, he saw our very need and he paid the exacting price on Calvary. Not only the darkness, but I want to point out the desolation. The desolation. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Notice the searching in that cry. His cry reveals the anguish of a soul without God. A soul without God has a longing. A soul without God is lonely. Is lonely. <coughs> Men today seek to fill their life with distraction. They are alcohol activities. They are they're they've got relationships. They're always running to and fro. They got a radio on, the TV on, the internet going. They got the phone in one hand and they're talking in the other, texting. All this stuff keeping their, themselves busy. But men are lonely. There's a void missing that only God can fill. They're searching. They're crying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But they don't even hear themselves crying. It. Abandoned by their God. His words are searching words. In the words of separation, you don't have to live a life separated from God. God provided a way for Adam and Eve. God's always provided a way. That way was temporary. When Jesus came, it was permanent. And we can have permanent. We don't have to go back and sacrifice Him over and over again. We can go one time and His blood cleanses us forever. And we can have that fellowship restored. We don't have to stumble in the dark. We can be reconciled to God. Romans 5.10 says we are reconciled to God by the death of His Son. It was His shed blood that bought reconciliation. We don't have to be separated from Him. Think about this. Jesus cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It said He cried with a loud voice in the dark. Alone, forsaken by all. Could have called angels down at any time. Could have said, that's it, that's enough. But he didn't. He did that so you and I would never have to feel the separation from God again. He who never left God, the Trinity, who always walked in perfect fellowship for all eternity, now fellowship is broken because of sin. And he says, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He feels the full weight of the separation of God. We walk around like it don't even matter. The world acts like they don't even care. But they haven't experienced it. They don't know what they're missing. If you've never eaten ice cream, you don't know how good it is. You know what I'm saying? You don't know how good the Lord is. 
until you taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. You, you, I hope you understand. Even, I want to give you something else to think about before I move on. Even if they falsely accused me. Even if they kept me up all night dragging me from judge to judge to judge. Even if the police officers beat me, stripped me, mocked me, blindfolded me, smote me over the head, pierced my brow, even if they put me out and hang me on a cross to die, even if they put me in a dark room and turned the lights out, even if they left me alone in that anguish, I'll never suffer what he did. You'll never have to suffer what he did. The Bible says he will never leave us nor forsake us. When he cried out, it wasn't, Lord, the pain in my hands, the pain in my, Lord, my back, Lord, my brow, Lord, my, no, he wasn't crying out for physical pain. It was the separation. What about you? Maybe we're somebody here and you're lost. And you know what I'm talking about when I say lonely. You know what I'm talking about when I say you're looking for something and nothing's filling it. Maybe you need to come. Maybe you need to come and experience what it's like to have fellowship with him. Notice also the scripture. I'm not going to make you turn, but in Psalms 22, you can read it. It foretold what Jesus would say. Psalm 22, verse 1, David the psalmist says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God had not forsaken him. You keep reading down through there, and it shows, it pictures the cross, what Jesus goes through on the cross. What Jesus was doing when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew was coming. He knew this point would happen, yet he was willing to do it for you and me. Notice lastly, the desecration. In verse 47, some of them stood there when they heard that, said, this man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on the reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, let be. Let us see whether Elias will come and save him. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake. That event was so horrible. The Bible says the earth did quake. I know what the skeptics say, but I know what the scripture says. The skeptics will say, well, it was a localized earthquake. The Bible says the earth, the entire earth, God's creation shuddered at the horrors that Jesus went through in that darkness after Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The earth trembled at what was taking place. And men were looking for a miracle. And it was right in front of them. Oh, that they could have only seen that he was the answer. Oh, that they could only see he was what they were looking for. Many mocking it, nor him today like they did then. They heard him. The Bible says he cried with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But yet someone says, Oh, he's crying for Elias. He's crying for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah come and rescue him. They heard him. They just ignored him. Like many today. They hear him. Revelations 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open, I'll come into him and him to me and sup with him. The problem is, you're just like all the skeptics, the unbelievers. You hear him, 
but you only hear what you want to hear. You ignore him. You try to forget him. You try to get away from him. They hurt him. How about you? They, Jesus was forsaken that we might be forgiven. I was thinking about that and I got to thinking Jesus had been forsaken before. This is not the first time Jesus had suffered the, being betrayed or forsaken. He was betrayed by his family. His brothers didn't even believe on him. He was betrayed by his friends. His disciples went back. He was betrayed by all his followers. There was a time they all turned and fled from him. Had they only known, had they only understood. But now, he feels abandoned and betrayed by the Father. And the lights go out. That's a holy God who will not overlook our sin, who will demand that sin be paid for, pouring out His wrath on Jesus Christ, my substitute. My substitute. Is He your substitute? Is He your substitute? Jesus looked at me and realized the only way I could go to heaven was to make a way. I couldn't do it. If they nailed me to a cross, guess what? I'm paying for my own sins and I'll have to spend eternity in hell and never pay for them. But Jesus was innocent. His blood was pure and innocent. When he died on the cross and he paid for my sins, he was able to get up again. And when the Lord looks at me, you know what he sees? Same thing he saw in Adam and Eve. He sees me covered by that innocent sacrifice. Only Jesus could see that value in us. One time there was a... I'll, I'll close with this story. really happened. One time a gym dealer... Went to a small town gym and mineral show, much like probably they have in Hidden Night where they lay out their gyms and their minerals and people can walk by and they can buy different things that's been found. And he noticed a blue violet stone the size of a potato. And he calmly went to the vendor and asked if he would take $15 for it. And the vendor looked at it and he looked around at some of the other stones and saw that this one was not as pretty as some of the other ones. And he said, just give me 10. That stone turned out to be a certified 1,905 carat star sapphire. 800 carats larger than the known largest one ever found. It was estimated, appraised, to be $2.28 million. It took a gym lover to see the value. It took a soul lover to see the value. God loved us enough that he sent his son. Jesus loved us enough that he went to Calvary and suffered what he went through. I'm going to ask you, are you going to be like the mocking crowd, ignoring, don't pay attention to what he says, only hear what you want to hear? Or will you call on him today and be saved? Will you cry, my God, today for salvation? Or will you scream, my God, tomorrow in hell? You're going to call on him. You're going to call on him. I'll never call on him. You're going to call on him. The question is, will you do it while he's yet a loving Savior? Or will you wait till he's a holy, righteous judge? But you'll call on him. I want to ask you about your head.